to the Marie that we have been mentioning over these last few nights, the elderly lady and the young girl. We're informed that there is also another young lady who is very unwell in Pakistan. We also have many of our family and friends that are unwell at the moment. There are people around the world who are in desperate need of assistance. Please raise your hands and let's join each other in sincere da'a. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a very quick recovery for all of those who are unwell and for shafa'a for all those around the world who are in need. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المصطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 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 بفضلك وبرحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين بحق محمد وآله الطاهرين سلوات أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين ولعن الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأشرقت الأرض بنور ربها بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما بعد قال إمام الحج عليه السلام الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين وينجي الصالحين ويرفع المستضعفين ويدع المستكبرين ويهلك ملوكا ويستخلف آخرين والحمد لله قاصم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصلحين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين سلوات الله سلام Master of our age, Imam al-Zamana, my respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum Jami'an wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Continuing where we left off from yesterday's discussion, in this section of Dua Iftitah, which has come to us by the awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam al-Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala, Faraj al-Sharif. The Aftitah, as we have stated on several previous nights, is divided into two. The first half is a praise towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our relationship with Him. The second is a praise and an understanding of our relationship with the divine leaders, representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The section we are looking at here is the bridge between the two. And it seeks to discuss those kings, those leaders, those autocrats, those oppressors and despots around the world that are the ones who seek to have power 
and feel that they can destroy that which is sanctimony, feel that they can destroy that which is uh, in the heart of God consciousness. And then of course, the du'a begins to discuss, discuss those leaders who are the divinely appointed leaders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it opposes those first groups of leaders. In the first group of leaders, we see that they are despots by description. And in the second group of leaders, the Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them all, they are leaders who have been described with their outstanding and glorious characteristics, the ones that we are obliged to follow and emulate, insha'Allah. Yesterday we began a discussion, and that was to understand that the Imam of our time, who is the awaited savior of humanity, is exactly that title which we give to him. He is the universal Imam of this humanity. He is this universal Imam of all of those within the fold of the world. And therefore, when we begin to understand our Imam, we need to see him as this universal Imam, and we need to see him as the one who will bring justice for the entire world. Hence, when we call out to him, we should not consider him to solely be the Imam of the Shia, nor is he the Imam of the Muslims. He is the Imam of everyone in this world. And when we begin to understand our Imam at that daraja, when we begin to understand our Imam at that level of existence, our understanding comprehension of him as an individual, and also his role as the governor of this world will begin to take shape. Hence our own actions towards him will also take shape in the same way. Yesterday we discussed this from one or two different angles. We brought a verse from the Holy Quran and we brought certain traditions from the Ahlul Bayt. In the Holy Quran, for example, one that we mentioned is one that we recite every single week in Surah Al-Jum'ah. We highlighted very quickly that Surah Al-Jum'ah being the chapter of Friday is one that we recite every week. But also the context for the Shia is that we believe that the Imam والسلام, will come on a Friday. Hence we pose the question, when we read Surah Al-Jum'ah, have we noticed where the implicit statement is about the Imam والسلام? We stated, the verse starts, he is the one who was erased from amongst yourselves, a messenger who has four job descriptions in that he must teach the signs and he must purify and he must teach the book and he must impart the wisdom. The subsequent verse says, وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And that from the latter generations, they shall also be the one who will come in this same light. If the Holy Prophet of Islam is the only one capable of teaching us the signs of Allah, the only one capable of teaching us the book of Allah, it cannot be an ordinary human being in the latter generations that's going to do the same. It cannot be you and I that's being spoken about. If the Holy Prophet of Islam is the one to bring the Qur'an, the one in the latter generation that brings about the true culmination of Qur'an in our time, must be the Imam of this humanity. And then we stated as well, that the Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, have these certain traditions that give us huge insight into how the Imam's coming will be, and into our role with him. The first one we stated from our fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad Baqir sallallahu alayhi wa in which he states that the Imam will come only when mankind wants him to come. It is not going to be that when he comes, we begin to fall in line. The goal is for us to fall in line with his thinking that whole of humanity wants this human savior to come and then he will come. We also mentioned another tradition from our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa in which the Imam says, Al-Mahdi yasna'u kama san'u Rasulullah in that Al-Mahdi will act just like the Holy Prophet has acted. And thus if we understand the Prophet correctly, we'll also understand Al-Mahdi correctly. 
Here we need to build on this. We need to finish this discussion and take it to the next layers of thought in our understanding of this particular sequence within the Holy Dua. To continue where we left off yesterday, we stated that we need to export Mahdiism. We needed to export the concept of this human savior coming. Why? Because we stated the fifth Imam says that when mankind wants this human savior, that is when he will come. When the people of Mexico, the people of New Zealand, the people of Alaska, the people of China, as well as the people of Dar es Salaam will call Al Ajal in a human voice, that is when the awaited Savior will come. He is the Imam for everyone, and everyone should want his presence on earth. To expand upon this point, we can show one or two very integral issues. The first one we stated was that. If, ima, if the humanity is going to call upon him, this is already innately present within us. We have found that all of the prophets and the imams have called for the return of the imam. We also find that within religion itself, religion is calling for a human savior. But the difference is within those scriptures, they do not necessarily have the active call that we have. Our active call is based upon the realization that the Imam was born 1200 years ago. He walks amongst us. He is in Hajj with us. He comes to Ziyarat with us. He should be present when we are mourning his grandmother Fatima al Zahra. And hence, when we call upon him, it is innately within us as the Shia. He is present. Hence, we call not for him to come, but for him to illuminate us with his presence. The difference between us and the others is that they are passive in this calling. And hence we need to make this idea vitalized. We need to make this manifested within the other religions. We stated that this not only is something capable because the awaited Savior is present within all religions, but also because we find that in the world that we live in today, it is a world of great difficulty. If you are living in Japan, you will have experienced great trials. If you are living in Greece today, you are going through great trials. If you are living in Yemen today, you are going through great trials. Hence, whether you are a believer in the name Al-Mahdi, or you are a believer in just an awaited savior, if we encourage the concept of everyone calling for an awaited savior, it should be easier because so much of the world is in need. The point is this, that when humanity as one global body becomes tired of our own versions of justice, when we get tired of implementing our version of an economic system, when we get tired of implementing our own political system and we see that each one has failed us after another, we will be ready to throw off that shackle and we will say, now I desire a divinely appointed government. Now I desire an economic system that is divinely appointed. I desire a penal code that is divinely appointed. And hence, I no longer want to see the pitfalls of what we have implemented. We have been asking for this day after day after day. But what would happen if in one voice humanity called for this very same thing? Now here we need to go further. Here we need to be constructively critical. We need to look within and ask ourselves, where are we as a global Shia community? We need to ask ourselves, are we performing in line with what is needed for this particular concept? Or can we do a little bit more to aid this particular concept? We stated one, this task of exporting Mahdism should be easy. Why? Because each religion has its own concept of a human savior. One. Two, that around the world they're going through problems, they will want a human savior. Two. But thirdly, on a practical level, we see that non-Muslims and I'm being very specific with my words here. Non-Muslims in some ways are doing more to bring about the coming of an awaited savior than most Muslims. What do I mean? Take as an example, look at the Occupy Wall Street movement that has taken place around the world. 
Go home tonight, take 15 minutes, go and look on Wikipedia or go and look on any website that discusses the Occupy Wall Street movement. Just in case any of our younger brothers don't know what Occupy Wall Street is, we will explain and then we'll go into the explanation. Occupy Wall Street is a title which is given to a movement which is around the world that seeks economic justice, that seeks to implement an economic system which is befitting for humanity. There's a very famous term that is, is presented. We are the 99%. What does this mean? That 1% of the world 1% of the world owns or has 99% of the wealth of the economy of around the world. Whereas the remaining 99%, they have that 1%. Really what's being said here, forget the literal statistic, what's being said here is that there is a group of people that are implementing their own version of an economic system that is made, it is created to suppress a certain mass. It is created to keep the certain mass in poverty. It is created to keep the mass paying back debt and keeping them in credit cards, keeping them paying them in interest. Today we have seen, and over these last few years, that as there was the economic crashes around the world, when people lost their homes, when people lost the things that they have had for dozens of years, the governments, instead of bailing out the people, they decided to bail out the banks. As a result of this economic crash, as a result of the concept of the economic system that is in place, hundreds of thousands of people from around the world decided to participate in a movement known as Occupy. The idea was that we will go to places which are the institute or the financial institutes of the world. We will go to Wall Street in New York City. We will go to St. Paul's Cathedral in London. We will go to such and such a street in Sydney. We will go to such and such a street in such and such a country. And around the world, hundreds of thousands of people took time out to demonstrate against the unjust economic system that is in place today. Now I pose a very simple question. Was that movement orchestrated by any Muslim movement? Was this led by any marja' taqlid? Was this led by any particular Mulvi in any country? No. This was a spontaneous human eruption of justice that they sought to bring around for the world. They were Christians. They were Jews. They were Hindus. They were Sikhs. They were atheists. They didn't even believe in the existence of God but they wanted to bring about a just economic system for the rest of their world. Now I ask you a question. Is that not a Mahdian movement? When Imam is looking around the world and he sees that there are hundreds of thousands of people that aren't directly associated to him, but they are working on his behalf to bring about a just economic system, whether they are named Muhammad or whether they are named Paul, is he not proud of that movement? Is he not looking at that movement and saying, this is something I could be proud of? It doesn't matter who is performing this movement, whether he believes in me or he doesn't. This movement is a pure movement to break a certain illegitimate, wrong economic system to bring about something which is more befitting for the state of humanity. Can you see how the world is taking shape in front of our eyes. Can you see that there are people who are actually working on behalf of a Mahdian movement, but they don't even realize it? Imagine if they understood what Islam could bring to them for this economic movement. Imagine if they understood that there is an awaited savior that is living somewhere, that he is residing somewhere, and he is weeping over the injustices on this earth, and he is waiting, begging every day to be unleashed, so he can come and bring justice around this world. Imagine if we taught this to them. Imagine if we were able to export Mahdism to the masses. Take another example. When the United States of America and certain other countries decided 
to unilaterally invade Iraq. People around the world, in their millions, demonstrated in the anti-war movement. We don't want war, we want peace. We want you to find a diplomatic solution. We don't want the millions of people that have been displaced around this world. We don't want your economic sanctions. We don't want your tyrannical bombs to be dropped upon human beings. Were these people Muslim? There were more non-Muslims than there were Muslims fighting for Iraq. Fighting for Iraq. Meaning that people around the world, in accordance to one statistic, one million people marched in London on one day in order to stop that movement, in order to stop the invasion of Iraq. Were they Muslim? They weren't Muslim. Again, we reiterate, we are making a really simple, wonderful point here. They weren't Muslim. They were Jew. They were Christian. They were atheist. They were Hindu. They were Sikh. But they had a goal in mind. Justice for this world. Again, I ask you, when the Imam is watching, when the Imam is looking at this event, is he not proud of this event? My people have raised themselves. They have decided as a collective human body that we no longer want injustice, we want justice around this world. The difference was when we marched as Shia, we did it in the name of Al-Mahdi. Whereas those people who marched who didn't know the name of Al-Mahdi, they did it for the sake of goodness and goodness alone. But what if around the world they marched in, on behalf of Al-Mahdi? How would the world begin to change? How would the world begin to shift? How would the world begin to come together in order to bring about this savior of humanity, this prince of justice? When we begin to see the world in this light, when we begin to really take shape, our minds begin to ponder upon our role as a Shia, our role as a Muslim in regards to this movement of Al-Mahdi. He is a universal Imam. And if the universe wanted him, then maybe he will come that much quicker. Hence, we are suggesting we need to conceive the idea of how to export Mahdism. When I use my Facebook account, and I'm speaking mainly to the youth here, there aren't too many of my elders and bapas that are on Facebook, maybe some of you are, but when we are on our Twitter and when we are on our Facebook, we should be using this for good. We have our non-Muslim friends, don't we? We have our Sunni friends on Facebook. What if we were to be exporting the message of Al-Mahdi? What if we were to be tagging people in videos? What if we were to bring about this concept? Now here we need to become again very much aware of what is taking place in the 21st century and what anti-Mahdian movements are taking place in order to battle the concept of goodness and justice. Here we need to understand this very, very specifically. In the time in which we are living in, we have seen post 9-11 that there has been a rise in Islamophobia. Today there are certain terms that are used around the world and the most famous is Islamist. If you are someone who wants justice, you are called Islamist. If you are someone who prays five times a day, you are an Islamist. If you are someone who wears hijab, you are an Islamist. If you are someone who doesn't think that Israel should have right to occupy, you are an Islamist. So they have certain terminologies. Islamophobia has been on the rise. But there have been two things in particular that have risen and a third that is about to rise. The two that have risen is one which is anti the Holy Prophet of Islam and two anti Quran. We have seen this Pastor Terry Jones in Florida. What does he do? He burns the Holy Quran. May Allah guide him and guide those who also have this very same thought. If you ask him, and you will see videos, you will see videos, scholars from the Qazwini family, scholars from Florida, asking him, have you ever read the Quran? No, I haven't. Why do you burn it? Because I think it's a, it's a blasphemous book. I think it's speaking about such bad things. Read the book before you go and burn it. What kind of ignorance is this? 
There is anti-Prophet and anti-Quran. But I am saying today that there is a third anti which is on the rise and the Shia need to become aware and very much in preparation for this third anti-movement. And that is anti-Mahdiism. Anti-Mahdiism. The reason why is twofold. One, when it comes to certain powers, we see certain countries and groups that are anti these powers. For example, we see the Hezbollah, we see the, the state of Iran, we see other countries, they are anti certain powers. The fact of the matter is when Sayyid Khamenei, may Allah grant him long life, and when President Ahmadinejad speak, you will often speak, see that they speak about a certain individual by the name of Mahdi. They are exporting Mahdiism. President Ahmadinejad will go to the United Nations and he will speak about Mahdi. The Shias don't speak about Mahdi. Ahmadinejad will speak about Mahdi. As a result, because Mahdi is deemed as the awaited savior of the Shia, as opposed to being the awaited savior of humanity, there are certain powers that want to speak ill of Mahdi in order to put Mahdi down. Today, there are certain writers who are actively being paid to write books, newspaper articles, magazine articles in order to be specifically anti-Mahdi. What they say is, your Prophet Muhammad is the one who butchered people. Your Prophet Muhammad is the one who slaughtered innocents. Your Prophet Muhammad created a system of Sharia which is this and which is that. When your Mahdi comes, he will be the one to implement the Muhammadan Sharia. The same way Muhammad killed the Jews, Mahdi will kill the Jews. The same way the Muhammad oppressed the Christians, Mahdi will oppress the Christians. Hence, there is anti-Mahdian writing that is coming out today. And instead of the world being pro-Mahdi, the world becomes anti-Mahdi. This is a fact. This is taking place around the world. The Shia need to be aware of this issue. They need to become aware of this problem. The fact of the matter is, we said, Al-Mahdi yasna'u kama sana'u Rasulullah. Al-Mahdi will act just the way the Prophet acted. But if I am the one who is presenting the Muhammadan Sunnah as being the one that oppresses women, the one that makes women not allowed to drive, the one that ensures that women can't even get educated, of course then I'm going to promote a Mahdi that acts exactly the same way. But if I am the one who learns how to state, look at the beauty of the Holy Prophet of Islam. Look at the tradition that we have been giving from this pulpit in the last few nights. When he came and someone gave that red Abba to the Prophet, he came and gifted it to Abu Jahl. Oh Abu Jahl, you may be the worst of enemies of God, but all I want is for you to be guided. When Abu Jahl responded by throwing that back in his face, Allah revealed the verse from Surah Al-Kahf, it may be that you will kill yourself with grief. This is the Muhammad who loves the disbelievers, not the one who kills the disbelievers. Mahdi is the one who inherits from Muhammad. He is the one who loves the whole of humanity, not the one who kills the whole of humanity. <coughs> Can you see how it's all coming to shape? If I believe in one type of prophet, I believe in this one type of Mahdi. If I believe in the Muhammad who is beautiful, who is loving, who is all-embracing, who is universal, who allowed Jews and Christians and non-Muslims to flourish in their own capacity, to achieve their own culmination of existence. Can you imagine what Mahdi I believe in for Mexico? What Mahdi I believe in for Uruguay? What Mahdi I believe in for Alaska? What Mahdi I believe in for New Zealand? What Mahdi I believe in for Dar es Salaam? Mahdi is universal. Mahdi is beautiful. Mahdi is the culmination of human existence. Mahdi is the prince of human justice. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, imagine what Al-Mahdi will be within his own human capacity. There are people today writing about Al-Anti-Al-Mahdi. 
What are the Shias doing? The rest of the world is marching anti-war. The rest of the world is marching anti-imperialism. Anti the rest of the world is marching against, uh, against economic injustice. And all of a sudden, I want to export a religion that is anti these people. They are performing a movement on behalf of Mahdi greater than what some Muslims are doing. Some Muslims are putting off the world, whereas non-Muslims are the one bringing about, the, bringing about Al Mahdi quicker than some Muslims. This is a fact. This is an absolute gospel fact. We have to wake up to these issues that we see within our world. These people are beautiful people. They are walking on the streets, marching for Iraq. They are marching on behalf of economic justice. Imagine what we can be doing. This is the level that we need to start thinking at. We need to start working with these groups. We need to start working on behalf of Al Mahdi in this manner. Because he is seeing the beauty of humanity taking shape. Whereas some Muslims want to be perverse enough to spread them and say, no, you are, at, you are not Muslim, therefore there is nothing for you in this world. Which Islam are they following? Which Islam are they truly understanding? They haven't understood the first drop in the ocean of Islam. Here we need to really understand Al Mahdi and what it means for his universal movement. There's a tradition I would like to give to you, and this is found in all of our books. If you want, I will bring it to you from Bihar and Anwar. I will show it to you. And our sixth Imam provides us with the most worrying of traditions. And having given you this very long sermon that I just have about us as Muslims, about us as Shia, and how some other facets of the world are working on behalf of Mahdi greater than some Muslims, I will prove it to you from a tradition of Ahl al-Bayt. Our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is narrated to have said the following, and I give this tr tradition to you verbatim. He says, when the flag of Al-Mahdi will be raised, the people from the east to the west will curse it. When the flag of Al-Mahdi will be raised, the people from the east to the west will give la'na upon it. The word is la'na, it will curse it. Now before I give you the rest of the tradition, I need to explain this. We need to contextualize this first half of the tradition. How beautiful was the Holy Prophet of Islam? How beautiful was Ali ibn Abi Talib? How beautiful was Imam Rida alayhi salam? And how beautiful will Al Mahdi be? We are talking about an individual that is going to bring about justice around the entire world. We are talking about an individual that will cease war. We are talking about an individual that will bring about all kinds of economic justice around the world. Let me give you a very simple hadith and you'll understand this. The commander of the faithful, may Allah allow us to perform his ziyarah this year and every year, has a tradition. He says, whilst I sleep under my governance, meaning when he was the caliph of the entire ummah, under my governance, whilst I sleep, there isn't a single person who goes hungry in the world. Meaning in his world, meaning in his area of the ummah. The ummah of Islam at that time is the equivalent of 80 countries today in the Middle East. Saudi, Yemen, Qatar, Dubai, Oman, and so on and so forth. All the way up to North Africa. The time of the Imam Ali salam, he governed the entire Ummah governed that amount, which is the equivalent of 80 countries. The way he had established justice as the Imam of the time, the way he had employed governors like Malik al-Ashtar around the world of his time, he had the confidence to say, under my watch, there isn't a single person who goes hungry. Now, if that is the justice of Imam Ali salam, Imagine how Al Mahdi with the wealth of petrodollars, the wealth of the diamond industry, the wealth of the gas industry will be able to bring about justice on this earth. 
Think about Al-Mahdi. How he is the culmination of human thought. If you are a master of engineer, he is the master of all masters of engineer. If you are a doctor, there is no question he cannot answer you. If you are a mathematician, if you are a psychologist, if you are a lawyer, whatever industry you are in, is there anyone more knowledgeable than this man Al-Mahdi? Which conversation can he not have with you? Which way can he not uplift your thinking and give you the perfect, correct answer? This, brothers and sisters, is Al-Mahdi. It is this human savior that is due to come. The one who is the peak of humanity. Yet, the hadith says, when the flag of Al-Mahdi is raised, the people from the east to the west will curse his flag. They will not want this man to come. The man who will bring such justice to the entire world, they will stop him from coming. Why? The sixth Imam continues in this tradition. When the flag of Al-Mahdi is raised, the people from the east to the west will be the ones who cursed it. Why? Because of what my Shia do and how they put the world off. What my Shia do, what our family, what our followers do, our followers of Ahl al-Bayt will be acting in such a way that when their Mahdi comes, the entire world will not want that Mahdi. Why? Because of the way we have portrayed him. We are the ones who have portrayed Mahdi wrong. We haven't shown him to be this universal king, this prince of universal justice. We think he's going to come and kill millions of people. We think he's going to come and, 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 and seek and, and obliterate people. The Holy Prophet of Islam didn't obliterate people. How will a Mahdi come and obliterate people? Which Mahdi are we presenting to the world? Our sixth Imam says we are the ones who are putting the world off. How are we when we do business with our brothers in Dar? How am I when I do business with my fellow businessmen in London? How am I in school? when I sit with my friends in university and in the workplace, am I that shining beacon of akhlaq? Or am I the one when you engage with me in business that I will rip you off? Am I the one that when someone gives to me a trust, I am the one who breaks it and loses it and can't give it back to you? Or am I the one that everybody, be you Hindu or Sikh or Ismailiya or Bahura will come and trust? We used to have that reputation. We used to be the Shia Ithna Ashariyyin. The ones who were the beaming lights of Ahl al-Bayt. Whatever you want, come to us, we will give to you. Look how Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam dealt with that person. That person came to him and cursed and abused his father, the prince of justice at that time. He came to Imam al-Hassan and abused his father. Imam al-Hassan responded and said, you must not be aware of whom we are. If you have traveled a long distance, I will give you my house to sleep in. If you are hungry, I will feed you. If you are thirsty, I will give you water. If you need new clothes, I will go out and buy you new clothes. If you need transport, you can take my horse. This is how the Imam was. And this is how we should be presenting our Imam. And this is how we need to be in the 21st century. This person abused his father. And look at how Imam responded back to him. Sixth Imam says, it will be us that puts people off the awaited Savior coming. Think about it. Think about it. Where we are as a Shia Ithna Ashari group around the world. Are we ready for the Imam's coming? Are we really understanding his coming and our role alongside the Imam? <coughs> we need to build. We need to think like the Imam. Here we will conclude with one verse. And we, inshallah, we will have understood this little rant of mine. There's a verse of Quran that says, Kuntum khaylan ummatan ukhlijat linnas ta'maroon bil ma'roof wa tanhawna alil munkar. You, Muslim Ummah, you are the best of nations amongst mankind. Why? Because you perform Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi anil Munkar. 
Meaning, the moment you stop performing Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi anil Munkar, we fall from being the very best of nations. But here I pose a question. I want you to think very deeply about this verse, please, my brothers and sisters. This verse says that the Muslim Ummah is the best of nations. When the Holy Prophet of Islam came, when the Holy Prophet of Islam came, what were the Quraysh like? What were the Quraysh like? Idol worshippers, thugs, thieves. To the extent they used to go to war so often that they had to implement where there were four sanctified months in the year whereby war was haram. Correct? Muharram, you're not allowed to go to war in. The non-Muslims adopted this. It wasn't Muslims that started this. This was a non-Muslim. This was a Qurayshi action. It was adopted into Islam because it was a good deed. The Quraysh used to perform tawaf around the Kaaba naked, correct? They used to perform tawaf around the Kaaba naked, clapping, singing and dancing. Think about this. Think about this deeply. When the Prophet of Islam came, this was the level of the Quraysh. They used to inherit their own women. True? They used to inherit women. Imagine how low these people were. At the beginning of the prophetic mission, these people were so low that that's what they were like. At the end of a 23 year period, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khayran ummatan ukhlijat lin nas. You are the best of nations amongst the whole of mankind. I, the Prophet, have taken you from the point where you are singing and dancing naked around Kaaba to Allah praising you where you are the best of nations. What does this mean? This means very simply, the Prophet's mind was up here. The Prophet's ethic, his mindset, his attitude was up here. At the beginning of his mission, the people he was speaking to, their mind, their attitudes, their ethics was down here. There was a gap. Correct? His mindset was here, the Quraysh was down here. By the end of the 23 years, the Prophet hadn't lowered his mind down towards the Quraysh, had he? He had lifted the Quraysh to being like him. Their minds were similar. They were able to feed each other. They were able to converse with each other. They were able to look after each other to the extent that the Muhajirun were able to leave their belongings in Mecca and the Ansar could give half of their profits, half of their property and everything they owned to those people who had left one city to come live with them. People's mind had come and met with the mind of the Prophet. Today, today, the mind of the inheritor of the Prophet, the Imam of our time is up here. Is our mind equal to his? Have we understood the same way? Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari understood the Prophet, their minds met. Ammar ibn Yasir understood the Prophet, their minds met. Hence the success of Islam. Kuntum khayran ummatan ukhrijat lin nas. The Imam's mind is up here. His thought process is up here. Our mindset is still down here. The moment we elevate our thinking to be in accordance with his is the moment our minds will converge with the Imams of our time and we will again adorn ourselves with that statement Kuntum khayrun ummata ukhrijat lin nas ata'amaruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna alin munkar It is that simple Our institutions need to be run in accordance with the mindset of Imam our families need to be run in, a, in accordance with the mindset of the Imam. Our philosophy needs to run in accordance with the mindset of the Imam. Marja'iyah needs to be raised in accordance with the mindset of Imam. Everything needs to run in accordance with the Imam of our time's thinking. How he sees our interaction with this world. How he sees our interaction with our brothers. How he sees our interaction with this entire universe in play. This is where we are going towards. This is what we must do for the coming of our future. This is how we must raise the next generation to think and to act in accordance with the needs of our time and how the Imam wants us to be. 
please raise your hands, join us in dua. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior. Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, allow us to be alongside Him at all times in our life and in our death. We ask you, Ya Allah, there are many people around the world who are in desperate need. There are the people in Africa, there are people in Asia, there are people in South America, all going through trials and tribulations. There are people going through wars, hunger, famine, poverty, illness. Ya Allah, grant them safety, security, education and victory. We ask you, Ya Allah, allow us to perform the ziyarat of the Imam of our time. We ask you, Ya Allah, allow us to perform the ziyarat of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them all. We ask you, Ya Allah, allow us to understand Quran, month of Ramadan, the fasting, and our Imam as best as we can. We say to Ya Allah, please forgive us for our sins. We are short, we are weak, we have come to you with many faults, but you can only prove us. We ask you, Ya Allah, forgive us for our sins, the sins of our parents, the sins of our loved ones, all those whom we love, all those that love us, all of our marhumeen, all of our ulama, all of our leaders. We ask you, Ya Allah, in the final moments of our life, when the shayateen encircle us and they wish to quench our thirst, and the Imam of our time comes to us and grants us water from paradise. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May I ask you to recite one loud salawat in honor of Imam al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu ta'ala Farajah al-Sharif.